All right. Well, welcome back, and thank you for uh, taking that short break. I, I certainly think that going a little bit long on that last segment was a, was a great idea. I mean, what we want to do, again, with this series is to try to introduce all of you to as many different dimensions of, to the practice of tax as we can. And Heather took us on a, a speed round there at the end with the last five minutes of her presentation through, through five professionals who really have shaped tax law. I work with Danielle, and she is remarkable, and as as all all five of, of those professionals are. So now we come to our last uh, panel of the day, and and in a way, as Joan said, this panel really does knit together uh, the first two panels in a, in an interesting way. So our first panel talked about tax controversy, and and Caroline, of course, was joking when she said you don't need, really need to know tax. She obviously knows tax, but much more of a procedural. Um, uh, practice, um, and, and our second panel was a, a highly technical practice, uh, but again, Joan started us off with an anecdote that if you don't have the receipts, you don't get the credit, right? So technical tax is all well and good, but you certainly need to understand what the facts are and be able to demonstrate the facts either to the IRS or to a court. And so with our last panel, again, we're going to knit these two together. Uh, in the context of state and local tax. Uh, and, and we're going to have a discussion around uh, the Wayfair case. And the Wayfair case is, uh, among other things, but that's going to be one of the key parts of the discussion here. The Wayfair case is a, a case that was decided in, uh, relatively recently by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the rest of us in tax practice um, raise an eyebrow whenever somebody says uh, something about making a constitutional argument. Uh, for those of, who practice in state and local tax, it's an everyday occurrence. Uh, the, the, the constitutional dimensions to state and local practice are real, and the decisions that the Supreme Court makes and uh, that practitioners anticipate the Supreme Court making are a very real part of practice. So Jay and Matt are going to take us through the run-up to that case and the aftermath to that case as people are talking about not just preparing for the case, but what are the, the ripple effects of that case as it's, as it's building up, and again, it's aftermath from a, a planning and a transactional perspective. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jay Calhoun. Jay is a, a partner in the, in the firm of Keen Miller in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. She is a wonderful and energetic member of our tax sec section leadership. I just bring king cakes a lot and then they like me, so <laughs> it works. It's a simple strategy, but it is effective. Bring beads. <laughs> and, and Matt Schaefer, who is the founder of Schaefer Law in Portland, Maine, and, and Matt, as he will explain, has a very close uh, connection to, to, the, to the Wayfair case. So before I turn it over to the panelists, this for me was one of the first realizations that I made when I came to the tax section, that the law is not something that falls out of the sky. The law is something that is created by people in this room. And so with that, I turn it over to our panel. Okay. Tom, thanks very much. So uh, as Tom said, we're going to use the Wayfair case as sort of a focal point for conversation. But Jay and I are going to, you know, essentially have a conversation about what it means to practice state and local tax law, how the Wayfair case has impacted the way we do that, um, what it means about having a career in SALT and how it's illustrative of some of the uh, different aspects of what we do every day. So full disclosure, as Tom mentioned, so I was co-counsel to the respondents, Wayfair, Newegg, and Overstock in the Supreme Court, along with my, uh, at the time, my, my fantastic colleagues, George Isaacson and Marty Eisenstein. And uh, that case grew out of another case that we'll talk about, too, a little bit, a case called Direct Marketing Association versus Broll, where I also had the fortunate uh, opportunity to be co-counsel. Uh, and I was, was thinking about this, Jay. I've, I think I've told you, I, you know, there's so many things that come back about the Wayfair case, and we're going to talk about that as a setup. Again, one of the things about that was uh, Justice Kennedy, in the Broll case, had essentially invited a case to challenge a 50-year precedent called Quill, uh, it's, it's Bell is Hess in 67, and then Quill Corp um, from 1992. Uh, at the end of Broll, he said, you know, there, the legal system should generate a case, an appropriate case, for us to revisit the rule of Quill. And um, 
to me that always sounded a little bit like the, you know, the uh, Henry II's reference to, about Thomas Beckett. Will someone please rid me of this troublesome priest? You, know, you had the Quill case, uh, had bothered states for years, and the states were only too excited about picking up the invitation, uh, and we ended up there. But to lead into it, Jay, why don't you give us a little Federalism 101 yes. on okay. and how it affects our practice of state and local tax law. Okay, so um, so I didn't really realize. See, so let me tell you how I got into state and local tax. I worked for the IRS for four years <laughs> in Houston, in council. It was fabulous. It was such a wonderful experience, and I learned all about personal income tax. And then I went home to New Orleans, Louisiana, because I was desperately homesick, and the IRS was trying not to have to let people go, so they were hoping to um, essentially lose people through attrition. So there was no openings in council in New Orleans. So I went to work for a firm there. Um, it was a big, big firm. I did a lot of things besides tax. In fact, the whole tax group had just left when I got hired by an estate planning lawyer, right, because I'd been at the IRS. And, and I was young. And I was terrified not to know anything. And people would, you know, these attorneys, you know, older, wiser, mostly men, attorneys would come running down the hall and they would say, you know, you're with the IRS. Our client has a sales tax problem. Can you help them? You know, our, our client has a property tax problem. Can you help them? And I was like terrified not to know the answer. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so then I would go, I would be like, you know, go into research, figure it out. And um, anyway, uh, and now I teach the class in two law schools and have been doing this for, for many, many years. But, um, but that was my introduction to state and local tax. And it took kind of a while to get uh, my head around different types of tax and that sort of thing. But, um, but to federalism, uh, the, what I learned is that um, originally, before the Constitution, there were the colonies and then the states, and they were having a very hard time getting together to um, decide how to do things they needed to do for the good of the whole. Because, you know, every single state is its own sovereign entity. It can pass its own laws, you know. But they couldn't raise an army. They couldn't do things they needed to do to sort of protect the new country without ceding some power. So those states are like the fundamental source of governmental power, which they ceded to the federal government, and that's our Constitution. That's a um, a recitation of the rights ceded by the states to this now centralized government, which has grown, um, and which has an absolutely gorgeous tax code, which is, um, <laughs> which all the parts fit together, and it has a kind of intellectual, uh, you know, purity. You can understand it. You know, Tom and I were talking earlier about how, um, at some point, you kind of think you know what the answer is because you kind of understand the principles when it comes to the federal tax code. Um, and you have the regulations, you have beautiful, you know, many, many volumes of regulations, and you have all the cases that flush it out, and you have a, a wonderful government agency that tries to help people understand, I love IRS.gov. I mean, it's like plain language tax stuff, and you can, you know, learn, like you can, you can actually direct people to go look at it, and they can understand it <laughs> to a great degree. Right. Um, so, but, but anyway, so, so that's our federal government, it, uh, and in the Constitution, uh, the, the states gave to the federal government under the Commerce Clause the power to regulate interstate commerce. And what is regulation? Well, the Supreme Court has said that includes taxation. Um, so Congress has the ability to regulate interstate commerce to protect a national marketplace, um, to the extent there will be uniform rules on state taxation, Congress could do it. Um, the problem is the states do not want any congressional interference, so there's a lot of pushback against that. So how do we get federal government, you know, uniformity, or how do we get rules um, uh, that the states have to follow? Well, so far, there have been a few acts of federal legislation, very few uh, and far between, which impose some limits, but the Supreme Court really has been sort of holding down the fort for any kind of uh, constraints on state tax jurisdiction. And with its states, you have multiple local jurisdictions, which also have to fund their operations, also have to collect money to do whatever it is they do for us, right? And they do things for us, right? There are things that we cannot do individually that we want our government to do for us, um, you know, for the good of the whole. We don't get a bill at the end of the year that says this is how much in government services you use, so this is what you owe. It's, we, we compute what we owe differently, and it's not an exact science, um, you know, but, but taxes 
or what we get to pay, our part we get to do to contribute to the civilized society, right? So, um, so anyway, so, so basically the Supreme Court, unfortunately though, doesn't, well, is it unfortunate? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it's unfortunate, but the Supreme Court doesn't legislate. They basically get one state's problem that comes up through the systems, uh, the, the courts of that state's, uh, those sta that state's courts, it gets to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides the issue with that state in mind, and theoretically with other states in mind, but they're looking at one set of statutes or one law when they make a decision for a particular state. Recently, we've had situations, because of the situation we're about to tell you about, where states have been suing each other on behalf of their citizens. Most of those cases have not gotten very far. So right now we've got the Supreme Court sort of saying, you know, we, we can decide and we're going to decide this state's tax situation for the taxpayer before us and then it has ripple effects because if the state wins and they've got a new method of taxation or they've exceeded what they've done before and other states see it, they will run out and pass similar legislation quite frequently. Um, state income taxes. Typically, you know, if, if a state wants to impose a net income tax, they have a choice. They can come up with an internal revenue code or they can start with federal taxable income, essentially piggybacking off of what the federal government has already done. So that's kind of like the easier, softer way. And most states will, you know, that impose a net income tax will piggyback off of federal income. Other types of taxes that states collect besides property taxes, those are usually local. Um, are sales and use taxes. So what are sales and use taxes? Sales taxes are what you pay when you go to the store and you buy an item of tangible personal property in your state. Now you pay them, but you don't, you know, you don't collect and remit yourself, right? Um, the store will collect and remit your taxes from you. So this is what happened. Y'all, you guys, us, we, <laughs> were tax scoff laws for many years. When the internet started growing and you could buy things remotely, remember when you could buy things tax-free remotely? Well, it wasn't that you could actually buy them tax-free. Any state that imposes a sales tax usually also imposes a use tax, which is the tax that you're actually supposed to pay if the vendor doesn't collect. So we weren't paying our use taxes. And so the states, you know, the internet's growing, um, more and more businesses are selling remotely, and we are going, oh, we're buying all this stuff tax-free. Um, and so the states, you know, usually if they require a vendor to collect and the vendor doesn't collect, there's, there's another law that'll say, now the vendor is responsible for those taxes. Well, that wasn't a problem if all the vendors are in state. If the vendors in the state don't collect and remit that state's use taxes or sales taxes, then they go after the vendor. It's a lot more efficient than coming to chase us down, right? They just go to the big, you know, the big buck store. Um, so the problem was these cases Matt mentioned. Um, the Supreme Court, historically, looked at collection of taxes. So basically when a business is required to collect taxes for a state, um, they have to have the infrastructure in the business. They have to pay accountants. Sometimes they have to pay tax lawyers. Um, they have to buy the software. The software is very, very expensive. Um, they, have to, they have to expend resources to collect taxes for the state. Well, that kind of makes sense if the, if the um, store is located in the state because if the store catches on fire, the fire department comes. You know, the educated workforce is being educated by the state. Um, there's, you know, lots of things the states do for businesses that are located in the state. They have property. They have workers. They've got, you know, they've got an obligation to do something and collect those taxes for the state. But what if the business has no connection with the state, they have no property in the state, they have no workers in the state, but they have customers in the state? And, you know, that's a thing now. That's possible because the Internet allows us to buy remotely. It used to be we'd have to pick up the phone, you'd have to wait for the Sears Roebuck catalog to come in the mail, you'd have to write a check, you'd have to mail it, and then there's credit cards. So there's lots of ways that we can now buy remotely, and the Internet has kind of changed the landscape. So we were doing that. We were buying stuff, and we weren't paying our use taxes. And most of us didn't even know we had a use tax obligation because if your governmental officials come out and tell you you have a use tax obligation, it's going to upset you, 
and you're going to think they're raising your taxes. It didn't matter that since 1930s, these laws were on the book books. We didn't know about them. Anyway, it became a problem when vendors weren't um, when vendors be able, began to be able to sell remotely. So the Supreme Court in several cases tied under the Commerce Clause. They said, um, you know, it's not going to be constitutional for a state to, re to force a remote vendor into their collection system to s expend the resources to collect and remit taxes to a state where they have no physical presence. That will be a violation of the Commerce Clause and in particular the requirement that there be sufficient nexus between the tax, the, the taxing state and the vendor. The state's not doing anything for these vendors. It can't make them be sort of enforced conscripts in the state tax collection system. They said that in the Bellis Hess case. I forgot what you knew what year that was. 67. 67. Um, and then again in Quill, 92. Yep. 92. And that's so that's precedent. So several Supreme Court cases have held the line that basically physical presence is required before a remote vendor has to collect taxes. But there's Amazon, and everybody hates Amazon. And they're a deep pocket. And it's not a problem for Amazon. And so, like, this is sort of, you know, I guess percolating in the heads of justices, including <laughs> Justice, Justice Kennedy. Kennedy. Um, and unfortunately, you know, did you say Justice Scalia passed away? He, he was like a firm believer in precedent. And, you know, we said it this time, we said it that time. We're going to have to say it again. We're not going to be able to just jump ship and change things. Um, but he's gone. And, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we, we're getting closer to Wayfair. So you mentioned uh, Justice Kennedy in the DMA case, which was actually, it was a tricky effort on the part of the state. So basically, we, they knew, the Supreme Court had said, you have to have physical presence before you can be required to collect remote use, use taxes. So what they said is, fine, all you vendors out there. You don't have to collect our use taxes. This is what, Colorado. But what you have to do instead is you have to notify all of your customers that they owe the tax. So they're like, isn't that like kind of weenie, a weenie thing to do? <laughs> they wouldn't go it's tell a, their citizens. A tattletale law. Right, a tattletale law. You have to tell your customers that they have to collect the tax. You have to, I mean, pay the tax. You have to tell them how much they have to pay. And you have to tell us who they are and what they bought and how much they owe us. And so the Colorado Marketing, the Marketing Association in Colorado uh, t took a case to federal court. It got all the way up to the Supreme Court on a standing issue, a standing issue. That's so, all the Supreme Court had to decide. But Justice Kennedy, what did Justice Kennedy do? So the case was, uh, <laughs> this is a good, I appreciate the 200 years summary there <laughs> as quickly as possible. So, so what we have, of course, we arrive in the, in the 2000s with a framework uh, under the Dormant Commerce Clause, as Jay described, that said, um, we have a conflict between state legislation in the tax area and the free flow of interstate commerce. Um, in Quill and previously in Bellis Hess, the court had settled that conflict by saying, we believe that the multiple state regulation of interstate commerce, 50 individual sovereigns, thousands of individual jurisdictions. They set up to 10,000. I've seen 6,400. I've never seen an exact number, but it's big. Yeah, so yeah. in, in, in yeah. Uh, Bellis Hess, it was 2,300, Okay. right? And the court <laughs> said, based on a congressional study that was done at the time, said, 2,300 jurisdictions regulating interstate commerce, this is going to be a problem. What we need to do is impose the physical presence requirement that Jay describes. We and, reached 92. And it's important, too, because, again, what is the state doing for you that it can require you to do anything for the state? And we have to remember what this country was, how this country was founded. People were throwing tea in the harbor <laughs> because some foreign jurisdiction was requiring that they do something for them, pay taxes. It's, an, it's like un-American, but anyway, yeah, go on. Well, and there was, a, there was a strong sentiment <laughs> in that regard, and the court had the ammunition of a congressional report, 67, backing up the idea that this was going to be an excessive burden. If you were doing business across the country, 2,300 jurisdictions, too many to deal with. By 92, it was 6,700 jurisdictions. So the court said, uh, you know, this rule this physical presence rule that sets a bright line that says if you are present in the jurisdiction through employees or an office or a store, you are subject to that state's uh, tax code. And if you are not, 
present through some physical uh, manifestation, then you're not subject to their tax code, and not required to And it's one. not for most states even having to pay the tax. It's having to collect the tax. Right. And most um, what we know very well as state and local tax lawyers, and one of the interesting things about what we do, is if you represent businesses that are engaged in interstate commerce, it's not that you need to know just your state's tax code, Louisiana's code, in my case, Maine's code. You have to understand that beyond that, uh, there are 50 other state codes, you throw in the DC, that are going to likely differ in different respects going to impose different obligations on that same business depending upon what they're selling, where they're selling it, how they're doing it, et cetera. Uh, and as a consequence, you get an overlay of federal law, sometimes through statutes, sometimes through Supreme Court decisions, like the Quill case and the Bellis Hess case. So the court in Quill had upheld the physical presence rule on the theory that it's complicated. Yes, this bright line rule is a little bit artificial, but we're worried about the interplay between multiple jurisdictions, and interstate commerce, uh, a value that the Constitution itself puts forward uh, as one of the important principles of our country as a, as a um, republic. The internet creates that much more agitation about this distinction. Physical presence doesn't seem to make as much sense anymore because we have uh, massive internet sellers like Jeff Bezos and Amazon and, and others. Um, Broll was a case that in the end turned on a federal statute about federal court jurisdiction called the Tax Injunction Act. And, and the, the company, the retail association, won the case 9-0 on the grounds that um, the Tax Injunction Act did not prevent it from going to federal court to try to um, defend against the Colorado Notice Law that Jay described, the, the tattletale tattle law. <laughs> but Justice Kennedy, in the process, said, you know, this underlying quill rule, something I think we ought to revisit. I think this, the legal system should generate an appropriate case. That invitation was picked up by the states, um, including, as it happened, a particular uh, Supreme Court practitioner who thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I think I might have an idea for how states could posture a case for the Supreme Court. And um, the result was a draft law proposed to the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, that law was picked up in South Dakota in 2016 in which the state said, if you have sales into the state, regardless of whether or not you have a physical presence there, we believe you have an obligation to collect uh, our sales taxes, notwithstanding the Quill physical presence test a direct challenge to the Supreme Court precedent, and the state promptly brought an action and set up this case in Wayfair. And so um, what was additionally interesting about the, the Broll case, which was the case involving the question of federal jurisdiction, it came up through the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. There was a judge sitting on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals at the time named Neil Gorsuch. He through the lottery system you get with federal panels, drew a seat on the three-judge panel for the DMA versus Broll case. And when the case went back from Justice Kennedy to the Tenth Circuit for further proceedings, Justice, now Justice Gorsuch, then Judge Gorsuch, also wrote a highly critical opinion about the Quill test. So we get the, the South Dakota law. 100,000 <laughs> 100, in sales or 200 transactions is enough. Uh, so, wh so where those rules came from are kind of interesting. Um, so in the olden days, when Quill was the rule and physical presence was required, um, the states hated it. So they kept doing things like trying to find ways around it. Um, if you have a dot-com affiliate and a bricks-and-mortar affiliate, they would try attributional nexus. You're physically present in the state through your affiliate. Um, they had been actually in the income tax context, they'd been making headway saying your intangibles, intangibles are physically present in a state, so you have to pay income taxes. So intangibles physically present, I know it makes you, your head want to go, wait, what? But, um, but anyway, that's what they were doing and they were, they were having some success. But they wanted to get rid of the physical presence requirement, so they knew what the problem was. If every single state's rules are exactly the same, 
then compliance is really not as much of a problem because basically you got one set of rules you can apply. You don't have to figure out whether one state treats something as a service or a tangible personal property. You don't have to figure out when it's bundled. You don't have to figure out, you know, if they tax this or have an exemption for that or they have different rates for this, that, and the other thing. You don't have to figure out any of it because everything's the same. So they said, we're going to get together. We're going to come up with some uniform rules, you know, as sort of we're going gonna to send delegates to what they call the Streamlined Sales Tax Project. And they're all going to come, we're going to come up with uniform rules and all the delegates are going to go back to their states and they're going to pass this in their legislatures. And then when we have enough, uh, buy-in, then we'll go to Congress and say, look, you know, nobody can complain, get rid of the physical presence rule because now the rules are uniform. Well, you know, that was kind of like herding cats and it didn't exactly work and they never got enough buy-in, but they did come up with some model legislation and South Dakota's rules actually looked like that model legislation. California never bought in, you know, New York, I think New York never bought no, in. No, no. None of, you know, so, so a small percentage of the states actually have streamlined compliant rules. But even once they pass them, the problem is there's a new legislative session every year and sometimes several times a year. And if the state is hurting for money, they tinker with the rules and they change this and that. So, so the ducks never, ever stay light up. So they never got uniformity. But that effort was there, and it was very, very nice, and you know, it didn't really get us anywhere. But <laughs> South Dakota's law <laughs> looked like the Streamlined Sales Tax uh, Project's model legislation. Right. It was a good test case for yeah. the states to advance. Uh, South Dakota was a, a, a favorable state. It relied heavily on sales tax for its revenues. It had a Streamlined Sales and Use Tax compliant tax code, um, and it had a, a, a legislature that was uh, interested in challenging Quill, advancing this statute. They fast-tracked the case to the best of their ability through the South Dakota system. Uh, and eventually, so this, the statute was passed in 2016, in early 2018, presented to the United States Supreme Court, and the court took the case. Ooh, and that was such an exciting time in state and local tax. You want to ask us a question? Or? I, I do. So I definitely want to get to the Supreme Court, but just a kind of a an advisory question for clients in the meantime. What do you do? Do you pay the tax? Do you not pay the tax? Do you put up some kind of reserve? What do you do? You, well, <laughs> we are going to get there. Spoiler alert. So here's the thing. You can put it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're Amazon, nobody cared about you before. They don't care about you now. Spend the money. Figure it out, right? You'll get some things wrong. That's fine. States need the money. When you screw up, that's an assessment. They make some money. The problem is small and medium-sized businesses. There is now a really difficult hurdle to start growing your business. Um, and, uh, and so what I have found is that some clients will come and they will say, you know, uh, we heard about this Wayfair thing. We don't have physical presence. We don't have to worry about it, right? And we have to say, well, you know, because spoiler alert, Wayfair got rid of physical presence. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, what, you, what we need to do is figure out where your potential exposure is, and then based on your level of risk tolerance, you can decide how compliant you want to be. And that is a horrible situation to be in in tax, right? Because as attorneys, we learn the rules. We learn the laws. We like to tell people if you follow the rules, you're not going to have expensive problems. There is simply no way to be completely compliant even if you got all the money in the world right now because of the situation. But anyway, we're leading up to Wayfair, right. and uh, we're talking about this very exciting time in the state and local tax world. So ABA tax, here's the plug for ABA tax. If you practice in this area, um, there is no way. And Joan very graciously said Jay practices. Jay does not practice in 50 states. Jay's licensed in two states, and Jay has to keep up with the rules in two states, but Jay's clients have problems in a lot of places. Um, I need that network. I need the network of people that I can talk to in Maine and, te you know, all kinds of states where people have issues. They refer work. So this is kind of the, the fun, cool secret about state and local. When you practice in state and local, you need to meet people. So um, it does certain, certainly attract people who were not cool enough for federal tax. <laughs> but, you know, don't mind hanging out with a bunch of folks and, you know, networking and developing that network. Um, and so, so you can, they can backstop you. They refer work to you. You can send clients to them when your client needs something in, in a far place. But anyway, so we knew Wayfair was being held in the Supreme Court. It was the hot ticket. Like, people lined up, and it was freezing in Washington, D.C. The weather was terrible. They camped out overnight, 
And I, now I'm thinking maybe this was a joke, but somebody told me L.L. Bean was camping out right at the beginning of the line <laughs> <laughs> with tents. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I'd heard that because I wrangled, um, I wrangled an invitation because one of my partners in Baton Rouge, her son and then his significant other had both clerked for Justice Ginsburg. The significant other was still clerking for Justice Ginsburg. And so I got to go. <laughs> like, I even signed up for the Supreme Court bar because I was going to, maybe they could swear you in, but they weren't swearing you in. Anyway, so we f I found out we had this connection. We wrangled a, an invitation um, to go as a guest of Justice Ginsburg's clerk. And I digress a little bit. I ride in a Mardi Gras parade in our signature throw or these decorated shoes. I'll tell you about it at the cocktail party. I gave Justice Ginsburg a decorated shoe, and I got an email back thanking me. Anyway, so... <laughs> So we go so we go up there, and um, it's old home week. And everybody you know in the state and local tax world is there and trying to get into the court to see this argument. And um, it was pretty exciting. Um, uh, when we got into the court, and he's going to tell you, like, because he was actually, you know, up there at council table or right behind hand, passing notes. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, anyway, you know, we got in, and, and they got up to, to make the arguments. And I remember when uh, Council for South Dakota, I believe it was, was up there, Justice Sotomayor, one of the first things out of her mouth, she was asking, um, you know, what happens if we get rid of physical presence? What happens to small and medium-sized businesses? And then, you know, after that, it all went south. But go ahead. <laughs> 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 she yeah, knew. So, she knew. So I think, yeah. you know, maybe part of the message is here. This is why, you know, practicing state and local tax law is, is uh, not dry. It's incredibly interesting, incredibly important, exciting. So West. I'll give you another sense, outside measure on this one. As Jay said, it was the hot ticket. Uh, I was told when we were waiting uh, to go into the courtroom that the, there had been more requests for tickets for the South Dakota versus Wayfair oral argument than for any other case in the session. And that included the Trump travel ban case, which was the, the original travel ban. That was the next week. Uh, there had been earlier in the session the Masterpiece Cake case. There had been an NCA versus Murphy, uh, you know, a gambling, uh, state regulation of gambling case. So, um, yes, it was a lot of those of us who were interested in state and local tax, but it drew an enormous amount of interest. Uh, so the court takes the case, um, and we know going in that one of the challenges we've got is that three justices had already criticized either Quill itself or the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, as a doctrine. So Justice Kennedy, of course, in role, had invited the appeal, in, in effect. Justice Gorsuch had been critical of the Quill rule in a remand decision. Um, and Justice Thomas has always been critical of the Dormant Commerce Clause as being something that doesn't have, in his view, any foundation in the Constitution, notwithstanding the fact that it's hundreds of years old. And uh, I'll, Justice Alito, for example, had pointed out uh, in the Wynn case that it's been reaffirmed by dozens of their decisions and dozens of justices. But in any case, three of the nine were not predisposed to, <laughs> to retain the Quill rule, um, which meant that we had to figure out how to argue this case in a way that, that we could possibly have a chance of, of uh, prevailing. And the, 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 the answer was stare decisis. Um, argue about a 50-year-old precedent and why it remains valid law. Um, and I have to say the oral argument seemed to go very well. Um, George Isaacson, a, he's a, a, a brilliant oral advocate. Everything seemed to go well. Jack Lee, the, uh, the, uh, uh, I apologize for not remembering you, Marty. <laughs> Marty Jackley was the, the Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, was under fire uh, from the justices during his part of the argument. And I think people we were surprised. We had hope. We had hope. <laughs> <laughs> people had expected, uh, not only with the, just the, the, the predisposition, perhaps, of three of the justices, but uh, because of Amazon and the, and the Internet era, that this would be swept away by a 9-0 to zero, uh, opinion of the court. But in the end, uh, it was a 5-4 to four decision um, with uh, Justices uh, Alito and Ginsburg joining Ginsburg. Kennedy, Thomas, and Gorsuch <laughs> in uh, the ruling um, with a dissent by Justice Roberts uh, on the issue of stare decisis. So the court went pretty far, however, in uh, criticizing Quill. Justice Kennedy's majority opinion said it was wrong when it was decided. Uh, 
in Bellis Hess and wrong when it was reaffirmed in Quill. It has always been a wrong interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Which is point. interesting because um, what does that mean about retroactivity? So the, the state, the state's uh, representative, and I think they had somebody from the Solicitor General's office up there too arguing, um, were, they were asked about retroactivity and they took the scouts honor, we will never go back. <laughs> And I will tell you there's a case in Washington right now where they're going back. But if, if it was always wrong, you know, then it was never the law. And so all of these businesses that weren't collecting because they understood what the Supreme Court had said for 60 years <laughs> were wrong. And so and some of the justices raised concerns about that. And that was something that the states very much tried to, to play down, the idea that there could be retroactive liability for companies that had been following a Supreme Court precedent. Uh, the chances that they would suddenly be exposed to enormous retroactive li liability because if you don't collect the tax, you become liable for it, was something that um, was a real potential risk. Uh, and it's not totally settled, as Jay said. There's still some cases out there. So far, the states have been behaving themselves, but um, it has not been utterly settled. The court decided that the... Commerce Clause rule that there must be a substantial nexus with the state that previously had been marked by physical presence would instead be marked by what the court deemed to be economic or virtual presence in a state, which it felt that, you know, it felt South Dakota's standards were enough, the 100,000 in sales or 200 transactions, but there was no clear rule. And I can't remember the line in the case, but there's something along the lines of a big old company like Wayfair surely is virtually present. What yes. is virtual Un presence? Undoubtedly present. Does the yeah, virtual yeah. fire truck show up <laughs> if your virtual house catches on fire? What is the state doing for you if you're virtually present? What does that mean? Right. Um, <laughs> it's uh, a new standard that now we have to deal with. So one of the things about practicing in this area, right, we've got federal law that overlays all the state laws that we try to help clients to understand in our respective jurisdictions. We need to change with that. You know, now we have gone from a uh, requirement that physical presence was necessary to a requirement instead that an economic or virtual presence can be sufficient. And what does that mean and how, what does that look like? The, re the practical result, of course, has been that every state has adopted an economic nexus law. Um, and and the, the standard now is does the tax pose an undue burden? So what is an undue burden? Right, and it's something that <laughs> has always been the underpinning of the, of the, of the uh, Commerce Clause principle, but one that um, was not resolved by the, the court in the case. The court, in fact, was not particularly interested, if I, if I may uh, <laughs> extemporize for a moment, in the facts that would dictate whether or not there was an undue burden. The court viewed the rule as being an incorrect rule of essentially competition law. They called it a judicially created tax shelter, which is just like, what is a judicially created? I'm sorry, I'm going to take a deep breath. Well, <laughs> a judicially the, created tax shelter, that was what Supreme Court precedent was held to be in that case. And it's an interesting comment because it really wasn't about tax law at the end of the day. You and I know that trying to comply, if you're a multi-state business, with the, the tax laws of 50 states and thousands of jurisdictions is nigh on impossible to do it completely correct. But the court, in the end, was not particularly interested in that, not particularly interested in the question. Didn't make it an impossibility. You could have raised that in another case, perhaps. But we, uh, we got what was more of a decision on, we think this rule puts a finger on the scale of commerce in a way that it shouldn't. And therefore, uh, we're not going to worry about undue burden right now. That's for another day. Um, we think this rule needs to go. Um, in my view, one of the things that was interesting about the way the court came out, Justice Alito had been quite pointed in some of his questions during the oral argument to the Attorney General for South Dakota. And if he had to make a call at the end of oral argument, you might have thought he was leaning toward the, the retailers. Um, in the end, he went with the majority. Um, something that I, I, I was somewhat surprised by. Uh, there were other, f you know, court and currents in the court's um, jurisprudence during that term that included Justice Alito writing uh, the majority opinion in another case where a long precedent was overruled, and he cited Wayfair in support of that decision. 
whether or not that had any influence on his, uh, his outcome in, in Wayfor, um, we'll never know. Um, so why don't we talk for a bit about what it means, Wayfair, for our practice of law as state tax attorneys. So we've had a sea change. How has it changed what you do for clients? What do you, what do right. you feel? So, um, so we've gone from arguing about whether businesses are physically present in the state through use of, like we had a case involving um, internet sales of computers and uh, the, uh, we had a client that you know was being sued for failure to pay income and franchise tax in the state as well as failure to collect the state's uh, use taxes on these remote internet sales of computers. There was another, uh, uh, and we ended up settling our case. Uh, we got creative. Um, a lot of the sales actually were to businesses. We were able to show that the businesses had actually, because businesses get audited. Individuals don't pay their use taxes, but businesses quite often do, so we were able to reduce that a bit. Um, we settled that case. Dell Computers, this decision I believe is out there, um, Dell didn't settle, they went to trial, um, and uh, the attorney for the state of Louisiana got up and took Michael Dell's autobiography and he said, you can read right here, he said, because basically they, if, you, if your computer didn't work, you had options. You could call Dell and they'd try to talk you through fixing it, but if you couldn't fix it, they had, you had a warranty services contract with a provider, a third party provider actually, in some cases like Eastman Kodak or HP, um, and they would come to your house and fix it. And in Michael Dell's autobiography it said, yeah, the reason we were so successful is we could come to your house. <laughs> I mean, literally, that was what he got up and read. Anyway, Dell lost the case. And so the states were, you know, doing everything they could to show that you really had physical presence, even if you didn't really have physical presence. And so we stopped having to deal with those kind of arguments. Um, and now we are really just helping clients with damage control. So um, Louisiana, in particular, has uh, 64 parishes, 63 of them impose sales and use taxes, and they're all self-administered. So Louisiana's kind of a problem state. Colorado's a problem state. Alabama's a problem state. They have a lot of independence in their local collectors. So the state and the locality can disagree about whether something's taxable or whether something, you know, they can all sue. And so, um, so anyway, so... Uh, so we've had, uh, so Louisiana's been trying to simplify things in Louisiana's own way. Basically, they created a remote sellers commission where if you're truly a remote seller, you can sign up and you can file this sort of complicated uh, return on the state system, uh, you know, and it involves the locals as well. But the locals can still audit you. Um, but if you're not a remote seller, then you have to go through a different system. And so if you <laughs> think you're a remote seller, but you're not a remote seller, you could like screw up, and so anyway, so we're simplifying things in Louisiana's own way. Um, but anyway, so we're we're doing damage control for clients where they're kind of looking. They want to, they don't want expensive problems. And here's the thing: if they collect the tax from their customers, they don't have to pay it, and so they don't really even care so much. I mean, it's expensive to have to do, but they don't really care. Like, it's, they don't want it to come out of their pocket. They don't want to make mistakes. So we're trying to help them figure out, you know. Again, we've talked about sort of risk tolerance and where exposure is and where they have sales. M Matt talked about South Dakota's rule. In South Dakota, what is it, $100,000 in sales, 200, 200 trans transactions. Yeah. The states are all over the map with transactions. Whether, whether you have, what if you make only wholesale transactions into a state? Do they count those? Some of them do. So you're filing returns but not reporting anything. Um, whether things are exempt or not. They're just trying to figure out, you know, how to uh, deal with the most expensive problems as opposed to dealing with everything, because they can't. Some of them can't, right? Um, and then we're still dealing with uh, our localities want to find physical presence anyway, because they, they still want to find physical presence because remote seller to the remote seller option uh, took effect last year. But if they want to go way back, they still have to find physical presence. So. Anyway. <laughs> yes, yeah, so now, we, <laughs> now as a practitioner, more complicated. You're, you're looking at not yeah. only physical presence, but also economic presence. So folks have to be able to evaluate the level of business they have in a jurisdiction. That in itself sounds like it ought to be easy. It actually isn't. <laughs> there are rules about when a transaction can be so-called sourced to a particular jurisdiction. Every jurisdiction has its rules in that regard. Does the jurisdiction tax a transaction? Do they exempt the transaction? Do, you know, what are the, what are the rules? 
Um, and, and they are, they're, they can be very different. Yeah, so it hasn't really gotten any simpler. It's, it's uh, really just added another layer of complexity. Now there is, there are oh. vendors, there are vendors of software that, that per, yeah, they solve m some of the problems. Like uh, 10 years ago, and I don't know if this is still true, I'd asked what is the cost of entry level software for this and I was told $30,000, so I don't even know. But, but here's where we are. Every state, every locality now has nationwide and even international jurisdiction. Well, that's kind of a problem because what if you have sellers in China? How are they going to go after these sellers in China? We have a new layer of complexity, which are marketplace provider laws. So now they not only want to get the vendors, they want to get the marketplaces, like the online platforms that the vendors sell on. And they can go after either one of them. Anyway, yes, sir. <laughs> quick, quick question. What if a business has a passive, only has a passive investment in a state? Like it owns a piece of real estate. Maybe it... Maybe it doesn't do. Are you thinking income tax? Are you thinking some sort of sales tax? Oh, with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a physical presence nexus. If you got, you know, how is a juridical entity present in space and time anywhere? It's property or it's workers. So you could have workers go into the state and leave. And with the pandemic, you, right. you had workers go into the state and work right. from home. So, right. like, they have little offices right. in these states. So, yeah, any kind of physical incursion. Right. Now, the rules are different. Some states might have a de minimis thing, but any kind of ownership in real estate, I can, you know, is going to end in up in real well estate. Time. Certainly, an interest in a business, you know, a la, is sort of akin to a shareholder. It's not a fully resolved question. Um, obviously, what many states then will do, if you're talking about a business of any size that is engaged in um, transactions that might be attributable to that state, they're often going to look for the economics first. So, if you're talking about a, a seller. Right? You, you can then talk about whether or not the transactions they engage in with customers in that state result in revenues in that state. If you're talking about a business that's not a seller and therefore doesn't have any uh, sales and use tax liability, they may or may not have transactions that are attributable to that state for income tax purposes. And there are quite a number of states that have uh, income tax thresholds for uh, you know, what level of income is attributable to the state and will that trigger uh, a reporting obligation. So you may be looking at that. Um, there are many others that simply take the position that uh, if they can, in essence, attribute some sort of economic activity to that company in the state, then they may, in fact, pursue income tax on that basis. But we can but talk it's about not a totally cool, settled a on cool the shareholders income side. tax Thank issue you. along the lines of what you just asked. Um, so. If you own stock in GE and you sell your stock in GE and you live in a state that imposes an income tax, what state gets to tax that stock? What do you think? When the gain from the stock? Where you live. Where you live, right? Why? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, historically, capital gain, that kind of capital gain has been taxed to the commercial domicile of the seller, the residence of the seller. Um, we have a couple of cases now. One is VAS Holdings. If you're involved in ACTC, you probably heard more than you want to hear about VAS. Um, uh, and Goldman Sachs up in New York, where flow-through entities own uh, uh, interests in businesses that are being sold. Um, we had a Supreme Court case in which uh, a company had a division that was not unitary. It was basically held as an investment, let's just say. Um, and they sold their interest in that business. This is the Mead West Faco case, and the Supreme Court said, unless you're involved in a unitary business, the, the seller and the asset being sold, unless they're involved in a unitary business, um, then uh, the state of the commercial domicile, essentially, I, I'm not super simplifying this, but gets to tax the gain on the sale. Well, what's happening right now is Massachusetts, New York, other states, Utah, they, they lost this, but they're taking the position that if you're selling an interest in a flow-through business that has in the, basically a sufficient connection with a particular state, that state can tax the income on the gain. So, um, <laughs> so uh, Mead West Baco would suggest that if the businesses are not unitary, they're not operating together to create income that you're going to tax that gain to the commercial domicile of the seller. These uh, new theories are saying, no, we're going to get to tax the gain where the investment basically 
is located because it has that kind of connection with the state. Um, so we just listened to a great, uh, and you can pull it up on the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Judicial Court mm -hmm. website, an oral argument in the Vass Holdings case in which the justices in that court were asking the parties, well, what happens if, you know, for example, you sell General Motors stock, you know, could it, could it be taxed or flow through entity stock, could it be taxed wherever General Motors does business? And the state said, well, yes, under our theory or something like that, yes, under our theory, but we're only going to go after the big actors. We're not going after the little guys. So um, what, <laughs> what we've been talking about with um, use tax collection, sort of the last bastion here, you know, the sale of a business entity may be going by the wayside. We'll see how this, because states have come out differently on this, and I don't know if the Supreme Court will take a case and fix the problem. So it's a great question because it also, as Jay's explanation uh, illuminated, uh, it does two things for purposes of thinking about careers in state tax. One, you're not just learning a single code. We all, you know, you always start with your own state's tax code. If you've got a state that's looking to impose tax on an entity or a transaction, you always begin with, well, what does the state's law say about it? Because that may be the beginning and the end of the conversation. Uh, but there's, there are steps to take beyond that, certainly, which, you know, things about what, what are the limits on the state authority in this regard? I mean, what so can a state say, ah, you know, you owned an interest in a business in that state. Uh, you were a passive investor. But we think the income you earned ought to be taxable to us uh, and, and, the that we, and that we have jurisdiction right. over And the you. fun thing about constitutional arguments is they're really, really fun, but <laughs> uh, state auditors, they don't think they're as cool as we think they are. So you, you generally have to fight these <laughs> cases up to the highest court in the state. Right. And then if they get it wrong, because, like, you know, they may have, you know, a vested interest in the tax revenues you're saying – you shouldn't get from our client. I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I mean that they are, what is it, home cooking? Yeah. Louisiana gets accused of home cooking all the time. I'm just saying. So you go up through the courts of the state, um, and then if they get it wrong, you have to hope the U.S. Supreme Court takes the case. Right, and as it's happened. Although in Wayfair, You know, we, there have been <laughs> a few cases in recent years in the state yeah. tax area that have reached the United States Supreme Court. The kinds of things that we need to pay attention to, be able to advise clients about, uh, and understand their impacts on uh, not only the specific areas of tax. Some of these are fairly, fairly narrow, and the question of whether or not there might be broader applicability is uh, less certain. Are y'all familiar with the Kessner Trust case? That was a great one. Uh, I think Kimberly Rice Kessner was not even aware, I believe, at the beginning that she owned an interest in a New York trust with a New York trustee and New York assets being administered in New York. And she didn't get any income from the trust. However, North Carolina had a rule that said, you know, basically, if you have the connection of a, a beneficiary in the state yeah, or something, something along right, those lines, yeah. then we get to tax the trust's income. And she didn't even know. Um, so they said, but they sent her a bill. And uh, she uh, litigated that, and they went up to the Supreme Court, and they found that kind of situation too much. North Carolina could not tax this New York trust income that she had no even ability to get. Like, she couldn't force them to make a distribution. Um, the Wynn case is also kind of interesting because if you have a, you live in a state that taxes your income wherever you earn it, um, but, you know, you're earning it around the country, other states may tax that income as well. The Supreme Court has suggested that a pattern of credits against taxes paid in other states will prevent uh, discrimination under the Commerce Clause so that it's not more expensive to own interests in businesses outside of the state. So the credits can help. Um, in the Wynn case, the state of Maryland allowed a credit against its state taxes, but not against its, uh, they have some local income taxes. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's a little bit of discrimination. The vast case I was telling you about where Ma uh, Massachusetts wants to tax all of the gain on sale, the owners live in Florida. So why is a credit situation not going to help them? Do you know? <laughs> no income. Florida doesn't have an income tax. Oh, I will tell you one thing about practicing state and local tax law. I have four children. Um, <laughs> And I was on the, my, my daughter was about seven, and she was sitting on the floor doing something, and I was on the phone with somebody, and we were talking about maybe somebody from work, and we were talking about income tax issues, and I said, yeah, I said, what are the states that don't tax income? I said, it's Florida, it's, you know, and I started to name them, and then she rattled them off, and I was like, I, I didn't even know how she could possibly know that, but 
anyway. <laughs> yeah, the win case is a really, so a lot of the interesting fights about federalism happen in the state tax context. If you are interested in constitutional law, in addition to uh, tax law, it's a great uh, crossover area <laughs> for practice. Win was fascinating because um, the residents were being fully taxed by the state of Maryland. They lived in Maryland. And they were making an argument that because they'd earned the income elsewhere, that they ought not to be fully subject to tax. The, the dissent, because eventually the opinion written by Justice Alito agreed with the wins, that there was a risk that there was going to be some discrimination against interstate commerce. It wasn't a risk. He viewed it as being a discrimination against interstate commerce for Maryland not to offer this credit. The, the countervailing view in the case was one that said, if you're a resident of the state, you are subject to that state's tax code on all of your income. And that was viewed as being by Justice Ginsburg and others as having been a, a principle that was established in the law for uh, you know many, many years. Um, so you've got a very interesting situation where uh, the federal constitutional principles uh, concerning interstate commerce crossed over uh, what would have been viewed, I think, at the time as traditional kind of understanding of state's jurisdiction over its own residents. Mm -hmm. uh, you get cases like that in SALT. It's a, it's a fascinating area to practice. Um, Should we talk about work-life balance? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's fun. Not? So it doesn't feel as much like work. So you do, like Carolyn was saying, you spend a lot of time doing this. Um, uh, it doesn't feel like as much uh, work if you're enjoying it. So um, the, uh, I have four children, I mentioned. Um, I do, I exercise for fun. I teach <laughs> jazzercise, which is a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, I do other stuff. When you are young and you're starting out in your practice, um, it is a little, I think, more intense. And then the older you get, somebody was asking me, this young lady was asking me, like, when do you feel like you know enough, <laughs> enough? You never feel like you know everything, but you get really good at, you know, sort of uh, managing the ability to uh, have clients be comfortable that, you know, give yourself enough time to go look something up. So, um, plus, then you get young and impressionable people who come to work for you and they get to help, uh, help you figure out uh, stuff, but um, but I think you know uh, taxes, and we were talking about this too. Tax is a great profession because all you're doing is you're helping people solve problems in a complicated area. Um, they need to pay you, pay, pay you a little higher rate to do it, and you know you really can help people. We were both also talking about the fact that both of us do some kind of pro bono things, not just involvement in the Bar Association, the American Bar Association tax section, which is a lot of fun. And also, you know, Carolyn was saying, get your name out there and basically say yes when somebody asks you to do something. And, and that has been a, a good rule of thumb. But, you know, but I can help people sometimes with things that they cannot do themselves. And, it, you know, it's a lot easier for me. And, and that kind of feels good at the end of the day. Um, but I like helping my paying clients too because, you know, what we're doing is we are making sure, you know, like the, there's a, there's a, the, um, there's a line in the ABA preamble to the model rules about lawyers having a special quality for a special uh, role in um, justice. And so it feels like that sometimes. It feels like, you know, if you understand the rules and you're trying to help the auditor understand the rules and maybe you're trying to help the court understand the rules and you're trying to help your clients understand the rules, um, you know, even if they're in flux, uh, it, it feels like you're doing something meaningful. I, I totally yeah. agree. And I, I, I want to second your comment on problem solving. It's one of the great things about this area of, of practice. Uh, people come to you with real problems that they need to understand to, to run their lives or run their businesses, and you're helping them to solve problems. Are they all the, you know, of the nature of uh, things that go to the U.S. Supreme Court? No. Um, are they all earth-shattering? No. But people uh, need your help to, you know, essentially be able to um, move their businesses forward, move their lives forward, and, and it's there's nothing more rewarding than that sense of feeling like you've helped uh, a client to solve a problem that they have. And I think as you um, progress further into the practice of state and local tax, where you've gotten the kind of basic understanding of the systems, because when I first started practicing, I was a litigator before I was a tax lawyer, um, even just understanding the kind of uh, concept of 
you know, the various types of state and local tax, you need that grounding. But as you move beyond that uh, to the role of more of a counselor, right. uh, there's a lot of reward in it. Um, it really does feel like you're 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 contributing to. And guess the what? You can learn all that international stuff too, because <laughs> if states piggyback off of federal taxable income and guilty is part of you know the federal computation, you have to figure out what the state level implication is. Um, is it guilty? The the tax basically where you were repatriating all of your income and you had eight years to pay it at the federal level. States didn't necessarily give you eight years. So we had to go in and negotiate for some clients, you know, basically to kind of get a comparable state treatment. Because when the federal government rules change, if the states start with federal taxable income, the states either have to adapt or modify, um, or they do nothing, and then you have a disconnect. Net operating losses often are calculated differently at the state level than at the federal level. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you get the cutting edge issues, you know, mention of digital services taxes. That's a, that's a, ba a battle being fought at the state level as well. So um, as our economy changes and becomes more sophisticated and diverse, state tax treatment of it um, continues to evolve. So, you you know, you get some very cutting edge technology uh, questions, the things you have to understand. You know, something I haven't really tried to tackle yet. How do you, how, what's, the, what's the tax significance of uh, cryptocurrency? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, how will that be treated as we go forward? Uh, and I understand that it's, you know, that, uh, still in development, but it's, Ooh, uh, it it's says a zero market. seconds down there and the big hook is coming. <laughs> no, well, I, I think that was wonderful. Jay and Matt, thank you. Thank you, Alfred. And, and I, I, everybody, all six of our speakers demonstrated it, but I'll just say it. Each of them is capable of explaining very complicated concepts in simple, straightforward, easy to understand ways. And that is the true hallmark of excellence in, in what you do in terms of being a counselor. And, 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 and Scott and Caroline did it, and, and Heather and Joan did it as well. And that's, I, I think, in terms of modeling what, what I strive for in, in my practice, and all six of our speakers did that. Uh, it takes, as everybody said, a lot of time and a lot of work, uh, but it is an incredibly rewarding practice. So with that, why don't we close the, uh, the session? We'll of course, invite those of you who are, who are here in person for, to join us for refreshments. And again, any kind of feedback, again, my name is Tom Greenaway. I'm the vice chair for CLE. Any kind of feedback on how we can make this program better and stronger and attract more people to tax law, by all means, let us know. Thank you. Thank you.